Hey reader friends, this is Mrs. Olson, and this week we're going to be reading a biography about a famous American. The title of our biography is The United States versus Jackie Robinson. The author of this book is Sudipta Barhand Qualen. Some of you may recognize her because she writes the Permade series as well. The book was illustrated by R. Gregory Christie. It was published by a company called Balzer Plus Bray, which is part of HarperCollins Publishing Company, and this book was written or copyrighted in 2018. This book is one of our Arkansas Diamond nominees this year, but before we start reading it, we need to go back and do something real quick. Remember the KWL chart that we learned how to do last week when we studied about goldfish and um, turtles and pets and other things like that? Well, we're going to use that same note-taking technique before we read our story today. The instructions say, before reading the bi biography, number one, add a note to tell what you already know about Jackie Robinson. So in this column of our note-taking chart, it says, I already know, and you're going to make a text box and type something here. Now, perhaps you have never heard of Jackie Robinson. That's okay. You can still look at the cover of this book because I'm going to tell you something important. This is a picture of Jackie Robinson. So just from looking at that picture, what can you tell about the man? Type it in this column. If you already know some facts about Jackie Robinson, tell me what you know. I'll be interested to hear. In the middle column, you're going to go ahead and write your questions, things that you wonder about his life. If you know a little bit about him, maybe there's something you've always wondered about. If you don't have any idea who this is, that may be your question. Who is this guy? Why is he important to American history? Maybe you can come up with your own questions. After you finish these two columns, we're going to stop with the chart read the book, and then number three says, after reading, I'm going to come back, add notes about the new facts that you've learned. All right, so stop for just a minute, go to your template, add the things you know, add the things you wonder, and then come back and Miss Olson will be ready to read. Long before anyone had heard of Rosa Parks, a guy named Jack refused to move to the back of the bus. And like Rosa, Jack made history too. Jack Robinson grew up in Pasadena, California, at a time when the public pools were open to black children only once a week, then drained immediately afterward and refilled with fresh water for the white children who swam the rest of the time. Segregation was the reality of American life. Most white people would not share schools, restaurants, bathrooms, water fountains, or seating areas with black people. White lawmakers in the South actually passed laws requiring black people to stay away from places that were labeled whites only. As the only black family on their street, the Robinsons were not welcomed by their white neighbors. Some even started a petition to get the Robinsons to leave, but Jack's mother, Mally, wouldn't go she made it clear to any and all that she was not afraid and that she wouldn't allow anyone to treat her family badly. Mally taught her children to stand up for what was right, even when that was difficult to do. Jack learned those lessons well. Even as a child, Jack was good at sports, so much so that kids at school would bribe him with treats from their lunches if he played for their team. As he grew up, his name and athletic feats were regularly in the newspaper. 
Jack and Mally dreamed that his talent would unlock doors for him, especially to college. When the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, recruited Jack to play for them, that dream came true. Jack became one of the most successful college athletes in the country. He won games, he broke records, he sealed championships. But a lot of people still saw him only as a black man. On the football field, opponents would go out of their way to hit him whether he had the ball or not. Even Jack's own teammates once used practice as an excuse to tackle him so hard that they severely sprained his knee. Black athletes weren't supposed to argue with white coaches, referees, or players. They were supposed to feel lucky that UCLA let them play at all. But Jack never forgot his mother's lessons. On or off the field, Jack wouldn't back down from anyone who treated him unfairly. Jack became the first person in UCLA history to earn varsity letters in four different sports, football, basketball, baseball, and track. But that didn't mean he could start dreaming about a career in sports after college. There was a line that had to be crossed to play on a professional team, the color line. White athletes could be professionals, but no major team would hire a black player. Jack couldn't bear to pursue a dream that would never come true, so he left college without graduating and looked to get a job. Not long after, Pearl Harbor was attacked and the United States entered World War II. Americans from all walks of life, including Jack Robinson, answered their nation's call to defend freedom around the globe. In the Army, Jack experienced segregation on a daily basis. On the base, there were separate places for black soldiers to sit and segregated barracks for them to live in. But for a long time, sports had been a place where Jack had been able to excel, regardless of the color of his skin. So one day, he tried to join the Fort Riley baseball team. When Jack arrived at the field, players were already practicing. Jack introduced himself to the white officer in charge as a potential recruit. The officer looked Jack over. He shook his head. Then he said, You have to play for the colored team. Except there was no colored team. Jack hadn't realized Army sports would have a color line too or that the Fort Riley team wouldn't see him as just another baseball player. But they only saw a black man. Jack watched practice for a while, his face flushed with anger. Then he turned and walked away, but he didn't forget. Soon afterward, a colonel asked Jack to play football for the base. Jack refused. The colonel sternly reminded Jack that he could be commanded to play. Yes, Jack replied, but he couldn't be commanded to play well. You wouldn't want me playing on your team, he said, knowing my heart wasn't in it. Jack never took a pitch or a snap for the Army. In May 1944, now guys, just to give you a point of reference, this was about 20 years before Mrs. Olson was born. In 1944, the Army issued an order forbidding segregation on military posts and buses. To black soldiers like Jack, this was an important change. 
even though segregation was found everywhere in America, from then on it was supposed to be different in the Army. When Jack was on Army property, he should have been free to go where he wanted. But just because the Army gave an order didn't mean that everyone respected it. Jack would soon learn that firsthand. On July 6th, at Fort Hood in Texas, Jack sat down in a seat in the middle of the Army bus. He didn't notice other passengers staring at him or the driver telling him to go to the back. The longer Jack ignored the driver, the more the man fumed. He stopped the bus and walked down the aisle. He bawled his fist and said, Will you move to the back? Jack knew his rights. He didn't argue but he didn't get up either. The driver glared. He warned Jack that there was trouble coming. Within moments of the bus arriving at Jack's stop, a crowd of angry white people surrounded Jack, yelling at him to know his place, calling him names. The crowd didn't see an officer in the United States Army they only saw a black man. When the military police arrived, they didn't detain any of the white people who had been shouting and making threats. They didn't discipline the bus driver for trying to segregate an army bus after the army had forbidden it. Instead, they decided that Jack Robinson was the one who was wrong. Jack couldn't believe it. He'd been charged with two crimes. This wasn't a misunderstanding or a mistake. Jack would be taken to trial before a military court called a court-martial. If he was found guilty, his army career would be over. He could go to jail. Jack knew the court-martial wouldn't have happened if he had just moved to the back of the bus. He worried how this would affect his reputation and integrity. But Jack also knew he had done the right thing. Jack remembered what his mother had taught him. He was ready for this. On August the 2nd, 1944, the case of the United States versus Second Lieutenant Jack R. Robinson began. The, prosecu the prosecution witnesses described a defiant soldier who ignored a direct order and was disrespectful to a senior officer. Jack had no choice but to listen while people lied about him. But when he took the stand, he told the truth with dignity. He described how the bus driver had ordered him to the back of the bus, how soldiers ranked beneath him had treated him like a criminal instead of an officer. He testified that the MP captain never gave him any orders. He had not done anything wrong. Then Jack waited for the real story to come out. And soon, the truth did emerge. Several of Jack's commanding officers testified about his excellent character and leadership skills. Some prosecution witnesses admitted that Jack had never ignored any orders because he was never given any orders. Others revealed that Jack had been called names and insulted just because of his race. After five hours of testimony, it was clear to the court that Jack had only been charged because of the color of his skin. The verdict was delivered, not guilty. Jack had fought 
for what he knew was right. He had stood up to prejudice and discrimination and exercised his right to sit wherever he wanted on a bus. He was one of the first black Americans to challenge a segregation law in court, and he won. Jack made history that day. But it wasn't the last time Jack would do that. After the trial, Jack asked to leave the Army. He took a job in Kansas City, and then another in Montreal. And in 1947, Jack went to work in Brooklyn, New York. But at all those jobs, most people didn't call him Jack anymore. They called him Jackie, Jackie Robinson. That job he took in Kansas City was to play baseball for a Negro League team called the Monarchs. The job in Montreal was to play for a minor league team called the Royals. And that job in Brooklyn was to play first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers. On April 15, 1947, Jack broke the color line in professional baseball. Once again, he had to fight for what was right, with patience and grace in the face of racism and hatred. And once again, he made history. By then, Jack had had plenty of practice doing both of those things. Well, guys, Mr. Robinson lived a long time ago. Miss Olson was a second grader when Mr. Robinson actually passed away in, I believe it was 1972 or 1973. So how do we know about his life? How do we know what happened? Well, remember a few weeks ago when we talked about primary and secondary resources? People have saved documents and have recorded history about things that have happened, just like in this biography. And we're going to go through some of these pieces of evidence and see which ones are primary documents and which ones are more considered secondary. So just to give you a reminder, Primary sources are when the resource is first-hand information, meaning the person that created the resource was actually there. They saw what happened with their own eyes. They heard it with their own ears. And that's things like um, a diary entry, a letter, an email, an autobiography, original photos, videos, speeches, original artwork, music, poetry, things like that. Also, newspaper and magazine articles from that exact time in history. All of those are primary sources. The person who wrote it or created the music or um, wrote down the, the autobiography was there and they knew everything that had happened because they saw it. Okay, secondary sources, the research that you're reading to learn about something is like the biography that we read today. Um, the author of the book we just read is a very young woman. She was certainly not present to see and document those things about Mr. Robinson. She wasn't even alive yet. She's like me. She's a little bit younger than me even. Um, so she wrote a secondary resource with her biography. Other examples of secondary sources are encyclopedia articles, like if you go to Pebble Go and look up Jackie Robinson, that's a secondary source. Nonfiction books like biographies or history of baseball that might mention Mr. Robinson, those are secondary sources because they just share primary source information. Um, TV documentaries and movies that retell historical facts or secondary sources, copies of artwork, copies of music, and articles that retell the event are all secondary sources. Okay, let's look at some sources 
from Mr. Robinson's life and try to decide if they're primary or secondary. I'll help. All right, this is a photo of Mr. Jackie Robinson that was taken in 1950 when he was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Would it be a primary or a secondary resource? Primary, good. This photograph is from the exact time that Mr. Robinson was playing ball. These are all biographies, just like the one we read today about Jackie Robinson. Would they be primary or secondary? Somebody is retelling the facts about his life. I hope you said secondary. All right, this is an article from World Book Kids Encyclopedia that is retelling information about Mr. Robinson's life as a ball player. Primary or secondary? It's secondary because it's retelling information. Good. This is a digital copy of a letter. This is a letter that Mr. Robinson actually wrote in 1958. He wrote it to President Eisenhower about the Little Rock Nine crisis that was going on just um, 30 miles or so from here and a terrible time in our history when some students were not allowed to go to school like the United States had ordered them to be able to do. And Jackie Robinson was writing a letter to the governor of Arkansas or, or to the president um, telling that the governor of Arkansas was not doing the right thing. So would this be a primary source or a secondary source? Mr. Robinson actually wrote about what was going on in history. So it would be primary. This is a telegram that Jackie Robinson sent to President Kennedy a little bit after um, the episode in Little Rock happened. And this time, someone had been murdered and Dr. Martin Luther King was planning to attend the funeral. And Mr. Robinson was very, very worried about Dr. King's safety. And so he wrote this telegram to the president asking for protection for Dr. King. All right. Would this be a primary or a secondary document? Very good. I hope you said primary because this is from that exact time in history. Good job. All right. These are books that we have in our fiction section of the library. They are historical fiction, but they are just based on the life of Jackie Robinson. None of these were written during the time that he was alive. They were written between 1999 and 2017. So Mr. Robinson had already passed away. Do you think they would be primary or secondary? All right. They would kind of be secondary because they're historical fiction. So there will be facts that are true about Mr. Robinson, but we wouldn't want to use fiction books for research because fiction books have made up things in them too, don't they? So the real facts about Mr. Robinson would be mixed up with things that just make a good story. So we'd have to be really careful about that. All right, this is a newspaper with a photograph and a caption um, from October 11th, 1939. This was back when Jack Robinson was still in college and it's telling about um, some of his success on the football team. So would this be a primary document or secondary? That would be primary because this picture was taken and this newspaper was made way, way back, right when that was actually happening. All right, this is a brain pop video about Jackie Robinson's courage and perseverance. So if you went to the brain pop website, you could click on this video and watch it. It's retelling about his courage. So would it be primary or secondary? All 
right? That would be secondary because the brain pop people weren't there to see this happen. They've learned about it from research and they're retelling what they know. All right, boys and girls, this is an autobiography. It says, My Own Story. It was written by Jackie Robinson about his own life. All right. It's telling about his first season in Major League Baseball. And in the book, he's writing stories about the things that he personally had to face, many hardships of um, other players and fans that were really, really mean to him during his first season. So if it's an autobiography and he wrote it about his own life, is it primary or secondary? Good. I hope you said primary. Are these getting easier for you? I sure hope they are. All right. This one is from a website that has famous American speeches recorded. And if you click on this little audio button down here, you will hear the speech that Mr. Robinson gave on the day that he was inducted into the Pro Baseball Hall of Fame. This was on July 23rd, 1962, and this is his voice as he was giving his speech. This happened two years before Miss Olson was born. So is this a primary or a secondary resource if it's his voice making the speech. Tried to give you some hints there. That one's a primary source. All right, and then finally, this is a movie. The movie was made in 2013, and it's said to be inspired by the true story of Jackie Robinson. All right, see those words, inspired by? That should give you a hint that it's not the exact true story it's inspired by. A movie review about the film says there are elements in the movie that are invented. So we know that this is not a true story, but it's got true facts in it. So would this be a primary or a secondary document if it's retelling but it's not even all true facts. It would be secondary. And to tell you the truth, Miss Olson watched this movie just the other night, and it was a really good one. So that might be one you want to ask your parents about if you're interested in Mr. Robinson and interested in baseball. It's got some language that's very, very sad and troubling, but it also tells the story of... Um, Mr. Robinson's courage and how he faced a bad situation and um, came out a hero. Yeah. Okay. Now that we have talked quite a bit about Mr. Robinson's life, it's time to go back to your KWL chart and finish this last column. Hopefully in our biography and in the other things that Miss Olson showed you about primary sources, you've picked up a couple of new facts about things that you have learned about Mr. Robinson, maybe you were able to answer the question that you wondered in the middle column, but even if you didn't get this question answered, tell me a couple of new facts, things that you've learned. Okay, so that's it for me. I'm starting to lose my voice, so we ended just in time. Go to your template, finish up this, click that green button, and I will check it for you later today, and I'll add my new sticker for you down here once I've checked your work. Guys, have a great day. Bye-bye.